which I uh, would like to read his introduction. Alex Boyer is a spiritual crooner, but it hasn't always been that way. Until five years ago, he was climbing the pop charts of Europe on the fast track to stardom. Then something changed. I seemed to have everything, but I wasn't satisfied, Alex said. Deep down, I felt a loss. Alex grew up mimicking the sounds of Motown, but never considered a career in music. It wasn't until he returned home to London, England, from a two-year mission for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, that he realized singing was what he wanted to do. In 1995, Alex formed the pop group Awesome. They performed locally at dances and other small venues, but in 1996, their dreams of making it big turned into reality when they won a vocal competition on London's largest radio station, Capital Radio. Universal Records of Europe signed Awesome for a five-album deal. Awesome released three singles off their first album, Rumors, which made top ten charts all across Europe. The group was working with high-profile celebrities and touring with artists like NSYNC, The Backstreet Boys, Missy Elliott, and MC Light. It really was a great experience, Alex said. It got to the point where I had all the things I ever thought would make me happy. I had fun and money, but then it really went pear-shaped. People's priorities began to change and the lifestyle did not fit him. When Alex left the band in 1999 to pursue a solo career, he lost everything. The record company took the apartment, the clothes, the phone, and the money. Despite the loss, Alex persevered with the driving energy inherent in his soul and in 2000 he released his first solo album, No Limits, which included pop and R&B for the new age. The album, full of uplifting lyrics, straight from the heart, reached number 12 in the European charts, but again he found himself in the same dilemma. On my mission, the spirit was there when I sang, Alex said. In the band, it wasn't ever like that, and even though I was now on my own, it still didn't feel like I was where the Lord wanted me to be. One day I was reading the scriptures, and it said to forsake this world and seek for something better, and how the song of the righteous is a prayer to him. I realized I wanted to do music that was more uplifting, that could do something for someone. Alex moved to Utah to begin a new career in faith-centered music. In 2001, he released his first gospel album titled The Love Goes On and gained a rapidly increasing fan base. In 2003, he released his second contemporary Christian album, Testimony, which features a moving collection of soulful ballads aimed at touching the soul and lifting the heart. Alex's heart and soul voice an engaging personality can move any listener, but it's his deeply rooted belief in who he really sings for that makes him more than just another entertainer. He said his inspiration comes from the Lord and his only purpose is to have the Spirit there when he sings. When the Spirit is there, it inspires you to change and to think about the things the Lord wants you to think about, Alex said. To be involved in that process is amazing. I'm not making the kind of money I used to make, and I don't have the fame and notoriety I used to, but I'm doing what the Lord wants me to do. Introduce Alex Boyer. Well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm so grateful to be here. Um, this is just such a smashing opportunity. I've, uh, I definitely haven't experienced something like this before, you know, because I've heard about the fair conferences and the people that speak, you know, and they're all, they have PhDs and about 150,000 different, you know, letters on the edge of their names and all that kind of stuff. And so they asked me to come and I said, the only letter I have on, you know, on the end of my name is like, on Boye, it has like an accent on the E, that's it, you know. I'm like, why you want me to come and speak to these people? They're just smart and clever. They know everything about, you know, everything that needs to know about the church, but I don't know. Um, I'll, I'll do my best, but I'm very, very excited um, to be here. I want to share with you a scripture. Um, this, is, this is one of my favorite scriptures. Um, and uh, I'm going to tell you the reason why. Okay, it's in uh, Doctrine and Covenants, section 4. Now, uh, 5 and 6. Now, we know all those missionaries, you know, those who've been on mission. This is like the famous missionary scripture. And this is what you have to learn, you know. But I want to share with you something here, because I remember when I first read it, and I was like, oh, this is good. It's right here. It's, um, first it talks about you know, the, the requirements you need to do the Lord's work. And so it says in verse um, 5, it says, And faith, hope, charity, and love with an eye single to the glory of God qualify him for the work. So if we want to do the Lord's work, 
We don't have to be connected. We don't have to have you know really good grades or anything. Thank goodness. We don't have to you know there's a, we don't have to be in the right clique or be in the mafia or whatever. You know, we just need to have those qualities. But there's some more qualities that we need also. It says here in verse six: Remember faith, virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, brotherly kindness. I love those two words, brotherly kindness. Because when I think of brotherly kindness, I think of people in the church showing generosity to black men. <laughs> anyway, that's why that's my favorite scripture. <laughs> anyway, I don't know where that came from. All right, so. I, uh, so as you know, I, I'm, I'm glad I had a chance to you know, uh, get that bio read so that I don't have to go on about me, and talk about me and stuff like that. But there are a few things that I kind of want to talk about. It's kind of interesting. I, when I first joined the church, I joined the church when I was 16. For my sins, I used to work in McDonald's. And while I was working at, in McDonald's, saving up to go to school, um, I met one guy, this guy, his name was Aaron Clark Wills. Very well-spoken black man. He spoke like the queen. He's this tall black man. He was, he was uh, let me see, he was about, at that time he was about 23 years old. And um, while we were working at McDonald's, there were six, they have six store managers that work in this particular branch in, in, in downtown London. And five of those store managers were awesome. There was one that everyone hated, including myself. His name was Aaron Clark Wills. I hated him with a passion. And the reason why I hate Aaron Clark Wills was because in England, all us, all the young folk, you know, we love to scrap. In case you don't know what scrapping means, it means to fight. Love scrapping. Always have to have a good scrap and a cup of tea. That was always the thing in England. Good scrap and a cup of tea and you'll last, you know, you'll have a great day. And so anyway, um, so during this time, I remember there was one time uh, we, we were, uh, I was going in uh, to work and, and Aaron Clark Wills, you know, I could see that he always used to look at me kind of strange, you know. Um, and, and I didn't really understand why. Anyway, um, because we all loved to scrap, we loved all the other store managers because whenever someone was caught scrapping, the store manager would just say, hey look, you know, just take it outside or just go upstairs in the restroom or change the rooms or whatever. Just don't disturb anyone and just, you know, when you finish, just come back downstairs, you know. It was great. Um, but when Aaron Clark Wills was on the shift, if he would catch anyone fighting, he would send you home with no pay. So here was one time, I'm here, you know, I'm in McDonald's, I work a 12 hour shift for this one day. The 11th hour, I get into a scrap. He catches me, he sends me home with no pay. I've been sweating for 11 hours, and I had nothing to show for it. So anyway, I remember, well, I went back to work the next day, and he put me on the same shift as him. And I was like, oh no, again, there's gonna be no scrapping going on today. And so anyway, I remember, um, when we were up in the staff room, in the changing rooms, or wherever he, uh, where all the staff is and everything, it was like everyone would sit on one side and Aaron Clark Wills would sit on the other. And so, you know, I'm sitting with everyone else, you know, and I was feeling really, you know, guilty because it was happening all the time. So one day I got my tray and I went over and I sat next to Aaron Clark Wills and I said to him, Aaron, let me give you some advice. He said, well, what's that? I said, you know, I could help you be so much more popular in this store. Would you listen to me if I had some, you know, some, some of my words of wisdom? And he was like, well, you know, let's see what you, you know, what you got. I, I'm, I'm open for anything. And I said, look, when you catch us scrapping, just let us carry on. It's not hurting anyone, it's not disturbing, well, it hurts for a little while, but you know, it's not hurting anyone else. You know, just let us carry on. He says, well, I can't do that. And I'm like, well, why? He says, well, I believe that the power, of, um, uh, the power of, of speech is stronger than the power of the fist. I believe that people need to communicate one with another without violence. I believe, and I'm like, what are you talking about? Are you one of those God people, right? And he says, well, kind of. I says, you are or you ain't. What are you? He says, okay, I am. And then he starts kind of speaking, speaking more spiritually and stuff like that. And I'm like, well, what church are you from? He says, I'm from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I'm like, who that? Otherwise known as the Mormons. I'm like, oh, mm, see ya. Took my train. I sat back over there with the rest of my people. Was not interested in a slight. And so anyway, one day I was, uh, I was coming home from work. And when I got home, it was, uh, 
I was really tired, you know, I've done like a long shift and everything. And as I was going towards my door, I see these two ladies at my doorstep. And so anyway, I'm walking up and I'm like, excuse me, can I help you? And they turn around. I was like, yes, um, I would like to speak to an Alex Boye. I'm like, that's me. And I was so excited. And let me tell you the reason why I was so excited. The reason why was because in England, 75% of entertainment, that's music, TV, radio, or whatever, is from America. So I've grown up with, you know, the American culture, although I've never been to America. I would go to school when I was in my teens and I'd like speak American and everything, you know. I'd watch like B.A. Baracus, you know, in A-Team and they ain't got no plane, fool, shut up. You know, stuff like that. <laughs> you know, that was my favorite show. And I'd go to school like impersonating B.A. Baracus and stuff like that. So anyway, but this was the first time that I'd ever actually spoken to an American face to face. So I'm like, can you say my name again? Because I just loved the American, you know, it, I just loved it. I grew up, you know, this time. And so anyway, um, they said, uh, I, I can't remember, what, they said something like, well, you know, we're members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and we'd like to share with you a message. I'm like, yeah, yeah, just come in, come in, just come in. <laughs> and I let him in. And so I said, can you just wait there just for a second, all right? So I went upstairs into my living room. I got onto my phone in my bedroom, sorry, in my bedroom, and I left the sister in the living room, went up to my phone, and I just called up all my friends at school. I said, you are not gonna believe this. I've got two American girls in my house, and they are so fine, you need to come over. <laughs> and so anyway, my friends came, and they was like, no, well, you've got American girls in your house? I was like, yeah. I was like, can I come over? I said, like, just come over. And so they came over. And so anyway, it was interesting. I went back downstairs, and I was stalling the sister missionaries. They were having these things, they were telling me to read this part, and read this part, and read this part in the Book of Mormon, and this bit about the saving, I'm like, yeah, okay, and, and I'd run outside, and I'd go to the window, and see if my friends were there, and I'd come back and sit down again. Finally, there was a knock on the door. I said, can you just wait there? I went, I opened the door, and honestly, probably about eight or nine of my friends just turned up at the doorstep. The sisters are looking at each other going, oh, we got baptized today, oh! They were just going crazy, you know? And you know, I didn't realize that, you know, they just had these big old smiles. So anyway, I, they walk in, they sit down, and all my friends are just like flabbergasted. Two American girls in their house, in my house. And they're like, I'm like, yeah, that's me. <laughs> and so anyway, they gave us a quick discussion and everything. I can't remember what in the world they talked about, but I just remember they're saying that they wanted to come again the next day. And so I was like, fine. They gave me some assignments, I can't remember what it was, I didn't do any of them anyway. But I remember I went back to school the next day. The next day I went to school, and you know what it's like at high school? News travels like wildfire. So, Alex Boye is this guy now who has these two American girls as friends. And so everyone's like, dude, I heard you have these two American girls, they're in your house, they're your friends. I was like, yeah, can we come and see them? I'm like, yeah, when are they coming over? I said, six o'clock tomorrow. Can I come over? Yeah. <laughs> So the next day, double, came. the sisters were like, oh, this is great, thank you, Lord, for answering our prayers. You know, there was must have been about 16 of my friends just turned up, and the sisters are teaching them all. But they were really, really rowdy. My friends were really rowdy. And this went on for maybe about a week, and it became apparent that no one was interested in anything the sisters had to say, other than the fact that they were cute and they had American accents. And so I started feeling really guilty, again, because that's just the way I am, I just feel really bad about certain things. So I said, look, sisters, I'm gonna stop them from coming over, you know. I'll tell you what, um, you come back tomorrow, all right, and I'll promise I'll be here and I'll listen to everything you have to say. And they said, okay, fine. Now, let me, let me just back up just a little before that. When I was about 14, 15, I used to have these really bad nightmares about dying. I used to just wonder, you know, what, what, what's gonna happen to me, you know, I'll just die. And it, I would just wake up in a cold sweat, you know, and it just played on my mind constantly to the point where even the church that I was going to, I didn't ask questions, I didn't ask them, you know, about death, I didn't want to talk about it because it just scared me. And I asked, I, you know, I had so many people I wanted to talk about, but I just couldn't, I would clam up. So it was a very scary subject for me for some strange reason, and I didn't know why. So anyway, during this time, I'm here back at, uh, uh, the sisters come back the next day, and they said to me, they started, you know, sharing with me a presentation. 
And part of the presentation, it was almost like, you know, they take turns and everything. And so one of the sisters, and she kind of mentioned as she was wrapping up her part of the discussion, she said, and so, you know, because the Savior, you know, he, he, um, he died and he was resurrected after three days, you know, and it's going to allow us the same opportunity to live again after death, etc., etc. And I'm like, excuse me? Wait a minute? What did you just say? She repeated it. I'm like, where is that in the Bible? She showed it to me. So show me another one. She showed it to me. And then all of a sudden, I just, I just burst out into tears. That was the most amazing thing that I've ever heard because of the situation that I was in before that. It was the most incredible thing. It was almost like a whole new world just opened up. Almost like these curtains. I'd never seen what was behind it before. And for the first time, the curtains opened, and I was just like, wow. And then they continued and they talked to me about a few things and certain things and, and situations and problems that I had in the past about certain principles. And I mean, I, I didn't know much. I was only, you know, 16 years old. But I had questions. And I felt at that point that all of them were answered. The most incredible thing. So within three weeks of the sisters coming back, I joined the church. I got baptized. Now, that's when the journey started. It's kind of interesting. You know, I realized that when I became a member of the church, there were a few things that I realized about myself that I had to change. Now we all know about the drinking and the smoking, and I didn't drink anyway, but I mean, I didn't drink, I didn't smoke or any of that stuff. I swore like a trooper, and I used to drink tea like anybody's business, like Alice in Wonderland, the Mad Hatters in the, you know, that party. Oh man, I loved my tea. And so, you know, although when I, when I heard some of those things, it was just so powerful to me that it just didn't, it wasn't a problem. But anyway, so, um, but it's kind of interesting, you know, you, you get baptized and you've got the missionaries, they sit right next to you, you know, and they, they take you to the church and, and they're all excited, you know, they've got smiles on their faces. This is like, oh, you know, our new convert, you know, and everyone's smiling and oh, everything's great. And they're teaching me how to read the hymn book, you know, because like in my, you know, the church I used to be in, you know, they didn't read the hymn book like that one and then one and then one and then two, and then two. I was like, we just read it all the way down. So I'm reading the hymn and they're looking at me thinking, what's he singing? I thought I was like retranslating the hymn or something. So anyway, and then you know, there's just things I had to learn. Like you know, when the la the next week they said, you know, come uh, bring your we're having a fireside, you know, so bring your shirt and your tie. And I'm like to go camping. <laughs> so you know, there's all these things I had to learn. But one of the interesting things was that I realized that there were parts of me that I had to leave behind. And at first I had a problem with that because I'm like, this is me. I can be however I want to because this is me, this is who I am. And then I remember just, I, I kind of realized, and it took me a while to realize exactly what those things were that I had to give up and what they actually meant. I think of like reading, uh, you know, in, 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 in the Book of Mormon and Lehi, you know, and his family, they left Jerusalem, okay? And then they left to go to the American continent, but the Lord told them that there were certain things that they had to leave behind. And it was their riches, right? It was their, their gold. And maybe that was something that was going to stop them, if they had it with them, from focusing upon what they were supposed to do, upon their assignment, upon getting to the promised land, upon receiving inspiration and revelation, you know, and that kind of thing. And so I kind of equate that to myself now, realizing that when I became a member of the church, there was parts of my culture that I had to leave behind. And then I remember it was probably a few years ago when I heard, I think it was Neil A. Maxwell in a conference, and he mentioned something about... <clears throat> he mentioned something about how there is good and there is bad in every culture in this world. Every single culture there is good and there is bad. And he said that when we become members of the church, it is our goal to get rid of the bad parts and to keep the good. And so then I realized that, wait a minute, because I go around saying, well, this is me. This is who I am. You can't change me, <laughs> you know. And then I just realized, though, that that's not what they were trying to say. And because those things that I left behind helped me to become a more effective member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And helped me to progress more. And I, I want to I, I talk to you just a little bit about some of those things, about my culture. Some of the things that I realized that I had to leave behind, which was really, really hard for me. But before I do that, I want to show you uh, just a, a little video presentation here of my, the group that I used to be in. So, you know, that's, 
this is what I used to do, this is my career, and I still, you know, I sing, I'm still in the music uh, situation, but I was signed to Universal Records with this band. I was the only member of the church in this band. Um, my friends, we all grew up together. We were best, best friends. And um, we, had a, we had a lot of fun. I'm just going to show you just a little excerpt here. Okay, this is a, a CD signing that was doing in, in Germany. Oh, thanks very much. That's me with hair. That was a long time ago. That was in 97. That's one of our music videos. That's me with the funny goggles on my head. This is another guy from the band. And, uh, this is one of our first uh, um, major CD signings that we had. It was pretty overwhelming. I, I remember that experience. It was the strangest thing because people would come up to you. You had, you know, these fans, they would give you stuff. They'd give you, not, not just like little toys, I'm talking cell phones, I'm talking sneakers, Walkmans, big old cassette. We, it was just crazy. I mean, I, had, I used to come home with all these presents. Christmas was awesome in my family. I'm wearing a CTR ring on my thumb. I want to tell you a story about that later on. If I have time. <laughs> Okay, this next segment, this is another short segment. This is uh, in a stadium in um, Berlin. There's 50,000 people in the audience and there's 11 million people watching this show uh, uh, all over Europe. Um, these are two MTV uh, DJs and they're announcing us on right now. I was famous for wearing these goggles on my head, so she's all that stuff. Um, Um, awesome was the name of my band. I'm really embarrassed about that. It wasn't my idea. It was my manager's idea. I didn't even know what awesome meant until I came to the States. But um, that's me in the front there with the goggles on my head. And I was very nervous. But it was a lot of fun. I just want to point out that here, I'm, I'm returned missionary. I've just got off my mission about two years ago. <laughs> and you see those outfits that we're wearing? I, I don't know what possessed me. I mean, these bin liners, I call them now. I mean, we were sweating so much. I mean, those lights are so strong. They have so many lights. I mean, I swear I was getting a suntan <laughs> by the minute. If I, I designed them, I'm really embarrassed about that. But anyway.
Okay, that's enough of that. <laughs> you know, um, it's interesting. So being in that band, you know, had some wonderful experiences. It was great. Um, a lot of, uh, um, got to achieve a lot, of, a lot of dreams, a lot of things that I wanted to achieve from, from when I was really, really young. Um, one of the hardest things, however, just cutting a long story short, was I was the only member of the church in the band. Now, you would say that that wouldn't really, you know, be a problem, seeing that we all grew up together, we were best friends and everything, and that was the case. But as we started getting more successful and stuff, I remember saying to them, the first thing, when I signed the contract, I, we all made a promise to each other, and it was my idea because I was a return missionary, because of certain ways, things that I didn't want to do, like the drinking and the smoking, and I heard all the stories about all the bands, and you know, I had friends that already committed suicide, um, who were in bands, um, taking drugs and all that kind of stuff, and just co totally getting caught up in that. And so we all made a promise to each other, and we said no drinking, no smoking, no taking drugs. And so we made a promise to each other, and it was kind of interesting because that's what we did. We were signed to the group, and that was a big thing for us. In fact, it got to the point where that became the focal point of the whole band. To the point where, even when our songs weren't doing well, even when our songs were flopping and was going down, because usually, they always say, you're only as good as your next song. So if your next song's really bad, you're not in the papers, you're not in the magazines, you're not on radio, nobody wants to know you anymore, and you're a has-been. But for some reason, we kept getting calls all the time saying, oh, can you come and do this show? Can you do this radio show? Can you come and do this um, avatar? Can you, um, we, we've got a sponsor for you. So-and-so is interested, Pepsi's interested. And we're like, why are you still calling us up? We kept asking them. And they're like, well, we don't know. We, you guys are just different. But, but our songs are not doing very well. I know, but we just like you. We'd rather have you than Backstreet Boys any day because you speak to us. You guys are fun. And you don't drink. You don't smoke. That's the strangest thing. The, everyone does it. All the bands do it. It got to the point where that was making us bigger than anything else. It wasn't even the talent anymore. In fact, the songs are really bogus, but everyone was just, they kept calling us up because of the fact that we had a certain code in the band that we adhered to. And it just got to the point where that was what helped us get more successful than anything else that we was doing. And but of course, as we started getting, it was this cycle, you know that cycle you see in the Book of Mormon, you know, you, things get great, you know, things going good, and then all of a sudden, you know, it gets really, really good, and then you take advantage of it, and, you know. And so what happened is, members of the band, you know, after a while, because uh, they didn't have as much of a motivation to keep those standards as I did. And so, basically, after a while, you know, one of them would start drinking and smoking and stuff like that. And I said, you know, we promised, remember? Oh, no, it's all right. It's just a social thing. You know, it's okay. It's not a problem. You know, this and that. There was no motivation for them not to do it. And so, anyway, it got to the point where one of the guys in the band, you know, he kind of, you know, got hooked on cocaine and stuff like that. And it just got worse and worse and worse. And then it just, you know, it, it just seeped through the whole, the whole band. It got to the point where I knew that I couldn't be in that situation anymore. When I was at an after show party and you've got guys next to you and they're lining up drugs and cocaine and other bands who are really famous and really popular that you all know, that in fact maybe even your kids know, in fact your kids have their CDs and some of the lifestyles, um, very destructive. You know, religion aside, just the lifestyles that they were living were very, very destructive and they were introducing that lifestyle to my friends and they bought it. And so we became, we were affected that. Even though I didn't take none of that stuff, I was affected because these were my brothers. I'm my brother's keeper, so to speak. And so anyway, I decided though that I, I couldn't take that situation anymore and I left the band, I left the group. So I remember just going back to something which I realized that I loved and that I missed. One thing that I missed was just the way that I was as a missionary, when I was a, a missionary for the church. And the way that I felt. Um, I want to sing you a song um, right now. Um, I, when I first, when I was, when I was a missionary in my first area, I had a, a mission companion who was training me, who was teaching me the ropes of how to be a missionary. And his name was Elder Buckelmund. He was from Germany. He was 27 years old and he never smiled. He was the most serious person I'd ever met. And anyway, I remember 
um, we didn't get along too well, because I was a total joker, happy-go-lucky kid, but I was also prideful. I didn't want anyone to tell me what I should do and how to be a missionary, because I knew it. I knew how I was supposed to be a missionary, and I didn't listen to the things that they were telling me and, and such. So we clashed. I remember one of the first times we had an experience where we were going to this shopping mall. It was in, uh, in, in, in Bristol, um, which is uh, north, northwestern England. And we were there, and he took me to this, it was kind of an initiation. And so he would basically get me to start speaking to people about the church. So he would stand there, and he would point to someone, he would like, go and teach them. And so I would go and I would, you know, share the gospel with them and try and, you know, get them interested in the Book of Mormon and stuff. And then uh, I, I gave away a book and I'd come back with a really proud look on my face, you know. And then he'd say, right, I want you to go and teach them. And so I'd go, no, no problem. So I'd go over there and I'd take that like, whole box of Book of Mormons and I'm giving them away. And then afterwards I'm going all over the place giving away Book of Mormons like crazy. And I'm having the time of my life. I'm like, this is the greatest work in the world. Wow, this is too easy. People are taking Book of Mormons. People want to buy them off me. They're so excited, you know. Some guy came up to me because he saw how excited I was. And he said, I want one of those things that you got. And so I gave them to him. And then I just carried on. But at the corner of my eye, I noticed that there was a, 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 a man that I don't know, he gave me, he wasn't happy with me. He gave me these really uncomfortable looks. He wasn't happy, but I knew that he wanted to speak to me. So he waited for his moment. And then finally he came up to me when he caught me alone. He stood in front of me. He looked at me, he looked at my badge. He looked at me again and he says, you're black. You know, there's certain things that you don't answer, right? Certain questions you don't answer. So he said, Did you know that people in your church did not allow you to become a member of your church and that you weren't allowed to have the priesthood? You weren't allowed to be able to have any kind of ecclesiastical um, uh, um, um, endorsements or anything in the church? And that you weren't even allowed to be baptized? People of your color. And so why are you walking around with that badge, with a happy smile on your face, giving away Book of Mormons, knowing the things that they told you, or the things that you, they, they taught? And I remember looking at him, and I looked him in the eye, and I just laughed. I was like... <laughs> Ooh, I know what you're trying to do, but it's too late. Because I am already converted. And I remember going home, back to our apartment that day. And I was with my companion. And we sat down, we just had a prayer together, and we were about to go to bed. And I remember, and I said to him, Elder Buckerman, answer me this question. Why is it that when he said the things that he said, that it didn't make a blind bit of difference to me? That it didn't shake me? It didn't shake my testimony? It didn't shake my belief in what I believed in and what I was taught and what I learned as being a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I said, can you answer me why that was not a problem for me? And then he looked at me and he says, I'll tell you why. And for the first time we connected, he said, because you and I are exactly the same. He says, because you believe in a saviour in Jesus Christ and he is the one that has the answers for all your problems he puts you in, in places where you can shine where you can grow where you can improve but at the end of the day whenever you are going through a hard time whenever you are going through problems that is the person that you can go to and he is there for you and he protects he guides you he helps you even through your trials and you still keep coming back to him because that is your motivation that is your motivation for everything that you do. And he said, that is my motivation too. And then he motioned over to the cassette recorder and he played a song. And that's the song that I want to sing for you now. Ooh. 
Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Be still and know that He is God. Be still and know that He is holy. Be still, O oh restless soul of mine, and bow before the Prince of Peace, and let the noise and clamor cease. Be still and know that He is God. Be still and know that she is faithful Consider all that she has done and stand in awe and be amazed and know that he will never change Be still Be still and know that He is God. Be still and know that He is God. Be still and know that He is God. Be Be still and know that He is God. Be still and know that He's our Father. Come rest your head upon His breast and listen to the rhythm of his unfailing heart of love It's beating for the little ones Leading each of us to come Be still Be still Be still. Thank you. Thank you. You know, it's kind of interesting that, uh, you know, being back home in England, you know, I always tell people this as well because I live in Utah now, you know, I live in Salt Lake. And, you know, I always get the question uh, about, what. Well, you know, about uh, being black and being a member of the church. And, um, and it always felt like, you know, when I came out here, that I was like the little, you know, the, the, the needle in the haystack, so to speak, you know. Um, the little de black dude amongst the, like a sea of, you know, milk and cream and vanilla and stuff. <laughs> and it was, kind of, uh, it was kind of interesting because back home in England, you know, I remember telling people, you know, my bishop's black back in England. My home teachers are black. My state president's black. Many people, you know, in my ward's black. Heck, even the hymn books are black. You know? <laughs> but you know, it was, it was never really a, it was never really a thing that I had to explain or, or, or feel out of place or feel in a situation where there was people that I could tell or, 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 or let them know about my situation. Because I was with people, we were all in the same situation, you know, and it's, I guess it's the way, you know, with the church or, or any church or any establishment. If an establishment's going to be set up in the ghetto of an area, then ghetto people are going to go to that establishment. If it's set up in a real well-to-do area, then well-to-do people are going to go to that establishment. So, you know, I grew up in a rough area of London and, you know, we had a church that was there and I was a member of that because that was the closest one to me and that's just how it was. Um, When I, 
when I was uh, 13 years old, it was Christmas Eve, and you know what it's like Christmas Eve when you know, you're all anticip anticipating Christmas and everything, and you've got your family around. I mean, you've got family that you don't even know that you had that turn up, you know? And everyone is there, and we had a great time, we were all, all, all excited. We went to bed that night, and it was probably about 6, 6.30 in the morning. I remember just didn't know whether I was dreaming or whether it was a reality where I had this just this loud bang at our door or a door and my first thing instinct was well you know maybe I was dreaming and so all of a sudden though on top of that I heard this loud scream and it was my mother who was screaming at the top of her voice suddenly I woke up knew it wasn't a dream I ran downstairs and I saw a sight that I'll still never forget. There was a whole group of police. They came, broke, you know, just made their way into our house. They pushed my mother aside and there was dogs and everything. They had dogs and they were going in to every single room in the house. And um, the bedrooms, the living room, wherever. And they were turning up the place. They turned over the beds. They went into all the restrooms, the, the cabinets and everything, and took all the, uh, you know, looking inside there. And they went into the fridge. They went into all our cupboards and everything. And I remember shouting and screaming, what are you doing? What's going on? Why are you doing this to our, you know, to my family and stuff? You know, I was about 13 years old and I was screaming and going crazy. And my mom was screaming, going crazy, rest of the family. And then um, I went into the kitchen and two of the policemen, they had my sister who was then, she was uh, 21, she just had a baby, six months old, and she um, was pushed over the counter, hands behind her back, and they read her her rights. And I said, Mom, what's going on? And she said, they say that there's drugs in our home. And I said, why are they, we don't, we don't take drugs, why are they saying that? And then with that, all of a sudden, you know, my mum starts screaming again and, and the police have taken my sister and they're going through the front door and I'm running and I'm chasing them and I'm trying to get my sister away. And they slam the door and I just hear my sister crying and just, just her voice just fading away in the background and I'm just by the door and I'm laying down there just crying my eyes out. And I remember as I was laying there, just kind of like a, just a few things just flashed. Just memories of me and my sister just flashed by me. The good memories, the bad memories, and, and some things that I hadn't thought of before. And one of them I remember me and my little brother, who was, uh, he, was, he was 11 at the time. And she used to ask us to, to go and, and, and deliver things to, to her friends and to people. Little brown packages. And she'd say, hey, can you just, you know, take this over to that address? And she'd give us the address and everything. And we was like, sure, you know, this is our big sister. We loved her. We respected her, mitre. And we'd go and we'll give these packages and, and we'll pick up, like, a, a letter or something like that and come back home and give it to our sister. And I started asking her after a while. I said, well, what's in these packages? What's in the letter? And she said, oh, don't worry about it. She wouldn't say anything. Then she started giving me more money. And then, of course, I stopped asking questions because she gave me more money. And then I'd go to school, you know, here I'm 13 years old and I was wearing all the fancy gear and everything, looking really cool and everything, you know, and so everyone wanted to know me because I had all the nice gear and I had all this money. And on that day, I realized what was going on. And I realized that in those brown paper packages were drugs. And when I was laying down at the front door with tears in my eyes, I remember I made a promise to myself that day. And I made a promise that I would never ever do anything to shame my name, the name of my family, or anything that will ever bring myself or the people around me into disrepute. And that was a very, very big thing for me. And so from then on, every time I was always looking for um, the good, I was, I was always seeking for it. And, and, and even at such an early age, I was always making sure that I rejected the bad. Whether it was at school and there was a ton of people that were drinking and smoking and all that kind of stuff, I'd stay away from it. Whether it was, you know, it was just all these things. Because that one experience just helped me, pull me on a certain track, a certain way. 
Whereas all my friends all around me were, you know, ah, uh, they didn't have any motivation not to do the typical things that people were doing in my area with the kind of low income families and that, that, we were all, that we all were and stuff like that. There was no motivation not to do those things. But I had a motivation. And so, when the missionaries were teaching me, and they were teaching me about just so much of these things, I knew that that was the decision and that was the way that I had to go. Because I knew that this would help me to keep my promise. This will help me to keep my promise and to stay on the right way, on the right track. Because it was hard. It was hard for me um, in my environment to stay away from those things. Even though I had a motivation not to do it, it was very hard because my best friends and people I cared about, respected, admired, and my sister was involved in those things. And so I guess what I'm trying to tell you was that being a member of the church for me, it started off more, a lot less about the facts, a lot less about what was in the scriptures, a lot less about what, um, what certain things meant and, 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 and certain books were about and, and, and the content. It was about the fact that there were principles in it that I knew that if I embraced those principles, it would keep me in a way that I could still keep my promise of keeping myself clean and keeping my family um, and, and, and keeping my family name above board, so to speak. And I've never regretted making the decision about being a member of the church. No matter what people have said, no matter what opinions or ideas people have said to me, I still, I have a gentleman that emails me once a month. He started emailing me uh, last September. And actually now it's kind of he's stepping it up. It's probably about twice a month now. And every single email, he's a very clever man. He has PhDs, these, he has all these, uh, all these things, you know, all these names behind him and everything. And he tells me outright the reasons why I shouldn't be a member of this church. And he talks, you know, uh, uh, about the, the, the curse. And, 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 and he talks about all these things. And, and, and I read it. Because I feel that I, you know, he has that right. He spent all his time, you know, researching and giving me all that information. And, and I read it. But I've never answered him back. I've never sent him an email back. And I think it's sometimes I kind of think that he thinks that I'm backing down. Or that I'm powerless, or that the things that he's saying is getting to me. But the main reason why is that that's not my forte. And so there's nothing that I can say to him that will change his mind. There's that whole thing about, you know, he is, he is of the, what is it, if you're of the same opinion still, uh, you, you, you can't change. If you have an opinion, you can't change a person's opinion if that's the same opinion. I know that me as a human being, as an individual, can't do that because maybe I don't have those tools to be able to do that. But I feel something that he doesn't feel. I feel those principles that's working in my life, that's keeping me in the right way. And that's putting me in a position where this situation where I am right now is better than any other situation that I could be in, for me personally. And there's no argument. You can't argue that. You cannot dispute that. You cannot dispute the joy that it's bringing into my life. I remember saying to, I remember saying to um, someone once, you know, if this whole thing wasn't true, if I didn't believe it anyway, you know what? I would die. I'd get to the other side and think, oh, huh, I was wrong. But you know what? I had a heck of a lot of fun while I was down here. And I had a friend who was another black member of the church. I was in Texas. And he just joined the church. And he joined the church because of the influence of a 14 year old white boy. Who every single day he would see him and he noticed that there was something different about this young white boy than all the other white boys. And he didn't know what it was. And afterwards he started realizing that this young kid was having the time of his life. 
But he had boundaries. And other the kids, the other kids, were free to do anything that they wanted. But they weren't necessarily happy. And I remember when he said that, and I was like, that is exactly how I feel. I had the time of my life, even through my trials and my problems, and my girlfriend breaking up with me. After, uh, you know, you know, you know. I, mean. I don't know. Sorry, don't want to get too personal here. But you know, just, just the, the things, the things that you go through everyday life, the trials, and even through that, I'm having the time of my life, and no one can take that away from me. No amount of philosophy, no amount of clever words. No amount of anti-Mormon literature can change that for me. I just want to uh, want to close up in a minute, but I just uh, would like to share with you something that I'm doing right now. Right now, which is something that's been very, very, uh, which has weighed very, very heavily on my mind, and it has come from the music industry that I am in, that I've been in, that I've witnessed, and that I have seen, that scares me. One of my things now, one of my biggest battles is I am fighting, I kind of see myself as this trench warrior, you know. And remember I was talking to you about parts of my culture that I had to leave behind? Well, there's one of them that I'm fighting with to leave behind but also helping other people to leave it behind also. And one of them is, I love music, and there are all different styles of music. And remember I talked to you about seeking for the good, and my goal, my purpose is to seek for the good in music, and to seek out the bad and weed out the bad, and to be able to help others, particularly kids, to do the same because of the influence of that music. Now there's so different styles, there's rock music, there's new age, there's jazz, there's classical, you know. Um, Boyd K. Packer, a member of the Corps of the Twelve, one of the apostles in the church, he said that there is good and bad in every style of music. It is up to us to look for it. And I see the influence. You watch MTV now, MTV is, 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 is actually, that they market it to the 12 to 17 year olds. The stuff that's on MTV that you see is stuff which mum and dad wouldn't even watch because it's just nasty. And, but that has become the culture and so the kids will continue to watch it because everyone else is. And one of the most popular music of today, do you know what the most popular music of today is? Rap music is the most popular music of today. It's bigger than any genre, bigger than country, bigger than jazz, Bigger than New Age, classical, bigger than pop music. r and I mean, just, there's, there's R&B music, but there is hip-hop music, there's rap music. It's the biggest. It is everywhere. Elevator music now, you know, it's just so popular. Even on, you know, kids' TVs and stuff like that, you know, watch Disney, there's like elements of that in it. Now, I will stand up and say right now that hip-hop music is bringing our children down. It is stopping them from doing good things. It is influencing them. And, you know, and even, there are many different styles of music, even the rock music and the heavy music, that's just bad too. But this is worse. I mean, you know, I talk, we talk about the whole Columbine situation. Five years later, all right, they were just, uh, the guys, the, the kids were just being interviewed by uh, some, some professors, I believe. And they spoke to them and told them that where their influences came from was some of the music they were listening to was already teaching them to do the things that they went up, ended up doing. So they were listening to songs that was already telling them to shoot up their school. And the influence was so powerful and so strong that that's, what, that's how they ended up doing that. And there's this young girl that did this experiment. She was 19 years old. She was from uh, Ogden, and she wanted to show that music can be affected, music can affect us in different ways. So what she did is she exposed um, these lizards to three different styles of music. So instead of using guinea pigs, I mean humans as guinea pigs, she used lizards. So she had this glass case, she had some sand and some rocks and some trees, you know, make her feel at home. 
and then she exposed them to three different types of music. First, she exposed them to classical music. She went away for an hour. She came back and she looked into the, into the case. And she was just, you know, <clears throat> she wrote down the, uh, the results or the findings of what she saw. And these lizards, you know, they were really peaceful and graceful, moving around and sort of like... <laughs> so she decided to write this down. Anyway, for another hour, she decided to change the music. She played some jazz, some soft rock, and some country. For one hour. She goes away, she comes back, she looks into the tank. And she noticed that these lizards, was, they kind of changed a little slightly in their behavior. They were slightly more erratic. And they were kind of just moving around. <laughs> so anyway, she decided to write down in her findings, these lizards were slightly preturbed. And then she decided to change the music again, even more drastic. She just exposed them to non-stop, hardcore, heavy metal, rap music, hip-hop music, R&B music, just the most angriest stuff as well of that style. Instead of going away, she decided to stay for about 15 minutes to see if she could visibly see a difference. She looks into the tank, she noticed that there was no difference. She was like, oh, that's interesting. So she goes away. 45 minutes later, she comes back. These lizards are freaking out. They are bouncing off the glass, beating their heads off the glass. They're spinning around, jumping up and down, slapping each other around. In fact, one of the lizards bit off the tail of the other lizard. Like that. <laughs> and so anyway, she wrote this down. And in her findings, she wrote that if, if lizards, the most base of animals, can be affected in such a drastic way by this type of music, then how about us as human beings with our sensitive minds, our complex minds? Can we be affected in the same way? Now I'm not saying that this good gentleman's going to go off and bite off the tail of this good lady because he's listening to rock music, but what I'm saying is that there's an influence there. There is an influence there. And so, um, I... Would, I, I would talk about this forever because I've had all these um, things that I don't want to go on too much about it but I just want to share with you one last thing and then um, tie this whole thing up um, it says here though, I, there's just some things that I, I read about certain artists some rap artists right now and these are the artists that our kids listen to of whatever faith any faith, they listen to it even our Mormon kids, they listen to it. And you've got the 50 Cent, and you've got the Eminem, and you've got the R. Kelly, and you've got the Snoop Dogg. And these are artists that your kids will know about. And then you have Snoop Dogg, who just received an award, a Kids' Choice Award. Which is great, you know, received the Kids' Choice Award and everything, it's fine. But then, in the same week, he received an award from the pornographic industry. So here's a man here who spends his whole time doing music that is full of talks about prostitution, um, about killing, about killing cops, killing families, killing all that kind of stuff. And he puts it in very, very nice melodies that are very, very catchy, and our kids can't get off it because it's so catchy and it's on the radio and we love to listen to it. But these are our role models of today. These are role models of the children today. And so when I listen to when I, when I see these songs and the influences that they have and how here's an artist here, Eminem, he just made a, um, a deal with a pornographic industry with Puff Daddy, who your kids all know, and R. Kelly, who your kids all know. And they've made a deal with a pornographic agency, uh, a company, because they are fed up of their, their stuff being on TV on MTV and people blibbing out their words and the lyrics and stuff like that and so now they are saying we you know the whole amendment thing we have the right to be able to express ourselves so they made a deal with this agency to do their own music station like MTV and they play all the unedited videos without the blibs without everything everything is there to be seen it's bad enough on MTV and so now it's going and they show it 24 hours. They have a channel. It started two months ago. Now, when I see these things going on 
And I see how the kids are influenced. You go to a school and the kids are wearing the same things as the girls in the music videos. The daughters and the sons are acting in the same way as the guys in the videos with not a care in the world, disrespecting women, disrespecting anything of authority. And then when I listen, I go to conference and I listen to um, the general conference at church or I read magazines like the Ensign and in it, it talks about the insidious nature of pornography and how our kids are being influenced by this type of music and the things and the answers, the things that we can do to be able to stop that from happening. Okay, this, these, are, these are the things that lead me to believe that here is a church that has these principles that can save these kids if we adhere to them. And even things as simple as the strength of the youth program and the things that are in it, that it can save these kids. Because if they abide by those guidelines, by those simple truths of good, they can steer clear from those influences and they can lead more happy and productive lives. I want to um, end with a song. Um, one of my favorite songs is called Somewhere Beyond the Moon. And it just talks about the simple truths of the gospel. Sometimes, you know, people always, oh sorry, one second. <laughs> Sometimes people always ask this, you know, particularly, you know, members, non-members of the church, you know, you know, they say, hey, you know, who are you? <laughs> who, what makes you think, you know, you have the right to believe in this? Or why do you believe in that and this and that? Who do you think you are? <laughs> you know, all these questions. And I love to sing this song because it just talks about the simple truths of the gospel. Sometimes we forget about the simpleness and we focus so much on, 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 on the fancy stuff. Uh, we forget about the truths and the, about the really simple things and, and, and what it does to a person's life. And, you know, I, I, I have a, my goal is to, is to be more scholarly with, with, with scriptures. And, and I'm reading a lot more. And, and to know and understand that. And because, and, but at the same time, I know that these, these simple things that I feel right here, that has nothing to do with here, they can't be explained, you know. And so, this song talks about just the simple truths of, 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 of the gospel and, and what that is to me and what that can be to us. <coughs> Long ago and far away. Before the laws of time and space A loving God prepared the place Somewhere beyond the moon High above this world's facade A perfect realm where angels trod The hope of man And the home of God Somewhere beyond the moon Somewhere beyond All doubt and fear Beyond the reach Of sorrow's tears where broken hearts run strong and free Where every child of God will be Somewhere tonight someone will pray Oh Lord you are the truth, the way And on streets of gold We'll celebrate Somewhere beyond the moon Somewhere beyond all doubt and fear Beyond the reach of sorrow's tears Where broken hearts run strong and free Where every child 
of God will be To every heart that will believe God's promises are true There is a place called heaven He has prepared for you And as sure as there's a morning sun And stars up in the sky One day we will see Jesus Listen now Can you hear The voice of God And He's calling clear Saying don't lose faith For the time is near And we'll be going soon ooh, 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 ooh. somewhere beyond the Okay, now's the time if you have any questions. We already have one. <laughs> what does your family think about joining the church? I did it kind of sneakily. I don't know my dad, but I, uh, my mom, she was living in uh, Nigeria at the time. And so I joined the church <coughs> while she was in Nigeria. Um, she wasn't happy about it. She wasn't happy about it at all. But as she saw that... Uh, that it caused no damage to me, and in fact it made me better than worse than I could have been. Um, it became less and less of a problem to the fact that now she just, she sees missionaries on the streets even back home in England, and she brings them home and she feeds them and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> Do we have any other questions? Is that it? Any others? We'd like to thank Alex then and his presentation. Thank you very much. <laughs> I had several questions as to whether we're videotaping this. We are. The videotapes will be available for sale on the website. Or actually, it'll be CDs. It'll be. Uh, Alex has brought a few of his CDs with him, and he um, and he'll pro provide them back at the bookstore.